A shop serves one community. Customers live within the walking distance of 10 miles or 15 kilometers. Shops compete to sell products and services for the least possible price, typically making a 12% profit from gross sales. This was the world of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Next, the factory arrives in the U.S. from Europe. It is surprising that the earliest U.S. factories had trouble finding employees. But this happened because everyone already had a full-time job on the family farm. The men and women of a household work 12 hours per day to feed, clothe, and care for the family. For us today, it's hard to imagine a time when practically no one obtained work by hiring themselves out for wage labor. The shop owner turned mechanized factory operator, tried many different ways to obtain workers. In the first few decades, women and children were often hired to do most of the work in a factory. Some operators hired entire families of the poorest of us who lived nearby and expected parents to keep their children working at the machines. It was often found that these families would work at one factory for some months and then move to another factory in a continued search for a better arrangement. Some factories paid wages in terms of rent in factory homes and in credit for goods obtainable from nearby stores. Other factory operators began to pay us employees in cash wages. Samuel Slater finished a management apprenticeship in a cotton mill in England in 1787. He heard that the Pennsylvania Society for the Encouragement of Manufacture and the Useful Arts had awarded John Haig 100 pounds for making a water-powered machine that would straighten cotton fibers for high-volume spinning. Slater decided to go to the U.S. To get through British customs, he disguised himself as a farm laborer. Slater was working in a spinning jenny factory in New York City when he heard that Moses Brown was trying to establish a textile works in Providence, Rhode Island. Since there were a few knowledgeable persons in the U.S., Slater got Brown to, to agree to give him a good share of the profits in return for his mechanical expertise. With Brown's money and Slater's knowledge, they built dozens of cotton mills in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. To staff their factories, they tried to hire orphans from the area and to contract with families for work in their mill. Day wage immigrants began arriving in the 1830s and 1840s who would work in the factories for yet lower wages. For 10,000 years, every farmer in the world has worked from dawn until dusk. Since we were already used to working 12-hour days, the factories continued this habit. The more hours we worked, the more would be the factory's output, but factory hours proved to be much more monotonous than farm work had been. It required a worker's constant attention to keep the various parts of a mechanical device operating. Some workers would sabotage the complicated machines to slow the pace of work. By 1830, we were already beginning to push for a 10-hour workday. While an apprentice spent several years learning a craft in its business, a factory worker is trained in a few days to perform a specific task that takes but a few seconds to do but must be done over and over throughout the day. Alexander Hamilton and Tench Cox published pamphlets and filled the press, arguing that industrialization would bring fiscal stability to the new nation, utilize its spare capital, decrease its dependence on foreign goods, and help to build war machinery.
They said that industry and agriculture would each purchase the other's products. They also said that the factories would provide jobs for women and children. But this was one thing that most other people wanted most to avoid. Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson warned that in England, factories resulted in rural depopulation and urban growth, poverty-stricken wage earners, increased inequality of wealth, and increased social tension and uprisings. They asked if we would be better off to stick to our agricultural society. Looking back, which of these predictions came true? All of them. Notice that similar discussions occur today in any nation debating whether or not to industrialize its economy. Throughout the first decades after 1776, there was much discussion in the U.S. Republic about whether or not the country should mimic European kingdoms and become a mercantile nation, pursuing state monopolies and a governmental share of profit from a few select market activities. This question was forgotten only after private parties were seen to be pursuing every opportunity. Glick says that a good description of the U.S. from 1776 to 1820 is that it was shedding its mercantile past. No one knew what industrialization would bring for the U.S., but everyone did know that it would not be built from centralized power, aristocratic privilege, or from governmental granted favors of monopolistic licenses. No one thought that the U.S. government should dictate the efforts of industry. From the start, the U.S. government was set up to guard against centralized political power in the world of local shops with staffs of three persons. Nobody could imagine the centralized economic power that would be the global corporation or imagine child labor practices or labor owner disputes becoming violent little wars. By the year 1900, government would come to be forced to play a larger role in economics, whether it wanted to or not. Big government came as a reluctant and delayed response to big business and the social consequences of our switch from farming to factory work. From the beginning, business has been decades ahead of attempts to govern it. Today our businesses are global in scope while government is not at all. Our shift from farming to factory work resulted in decreased community ties. We changed from being rural communities of mutually assisting farmers who traded harvesting and processing assistance to being more independent big city factory workers who had fewer reasons to exchange help because no chore required more than a few moments of a single person's time. Our industrial revolution also brought a decrease in control over our own continued well-being as we switched from living directly from our own farming efforts where the quality of our lives depended on no one except ourselves and the weather to wage earning in which that quality can suddenly be altered due to the ups and downs of the economic cycle or the whims of bosses or the cost saving or merger decisions made by distant persons. We came to have less control over the continued quality of our own lives because our wages might stop at any moment. As our wage decreases so does the quality of our lives because we can no longer pay rent or buy food the system of live-in apprenticeships ended because, as was just mentioned, factory workers are trained in a few days to perform a specific task that takes just a few seconds to do. Notice that factory workers do not live in the home of the factory owner. Gone was the system of training, clothing, and feeding apprentices for several years as they lived in the home of the teaching craftsperson. The individuals of our urban society today 
are not dependent on neighbors to harvest crops, but they are very much interdependent as wage-earning laborer customers. Factory production is 100% dependent on masses of laborer customers who not only work in factories but also use wages to buy the products of factories. When purchases decrease, then production and employment decrease also. Factories exist only if wages are used to buy factory products. Notice that greater wages would result in increased purchases and increased factory profits, but probably at someone else's factory, so each factory owner pays the lowest possible wage. In his book, Industrializing America, the 19th Century, Walter Lick explains that the process of industrialization in the U.S. occurred in a sporadic manner and required several decades to develop and spread. It was not the case that the entire nation chose to industrialize and urbanize and then did it on one Tuesday. Throughout these decades, handmade items continued to be made in small shops and in home-based shops. Lick says that a better term than industrialization is an expansion of the market to include the buying and selling of everything in a commercial manner. Until steam power became available, factories had to be built in the more remote places where water power was available. Wherever a river could supply water power, there would soon be a factory. New England has many year-round streams, as also occurs in England. By the year 1830, there were hundreds of water-powered factories along these New England waterways. This was the beginning of industry in the U.S. Notice also that the mechanical factory's dependence on waterways meant that large cities had few water-powered factories. New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore had to wait for steam power to arrive after the year 1850 before they could mechanize their operation and this meant the demise of the riverside mill villages. Before steam power mechanized city factories, they could not compete with the low-cost mass production factories. Instead, city shops made small quantities of more customized items. Lick explains that industry continued to be a mixture of small shops, large factories, and in fact, the U.S. simultaneously contained every sort of economic activity known to human beings, including gathering and hunting, subsistence farming, tenant farming, commercial agriculture, fishing, lumbering, mining, crafting, slavery, wage labor, apprentice labor, home production by the family, and bartering of goods and services. Starting a business in the U.S. was less restricted than in Europe due to the absence of guilds. Where parliamentary or legislative action used to be required to create a corporation, individual states began simply to require that a few forms be filled out. But starting assets were still needed to begin a company. For the first time in the U.S., business entities were being formed that combined money from several unrelated investors to begin commercial projects that would not be directly operated by those investors. Before this time, two relatives or friends might pool together their own knowledge and labor to begin a business. One way for people to pool their resources is by forming a corporation which is a permanent organization that continues to exist even as its operators and directors come and go. A corporation comes into existence by selling stock in its operations to people who want to invest money in the corporation. Corporate profit is distributed among its stockholders. If it instead loses money, then it will obtain additional funds from its stockholders. A small group of persons are hired to make decisions for the corporation. These persons are paid a salary and may also own stock in the company. Today, many small businesses are set up as corporations because those are viewed to be more permanent than our sole proprietorships.
Francis Cabot Lowell received a math degree from Harvard and became a Boston merchant. In 1810, he went to England to search for investment opportunities. He visited several textile mills and carefully took mental notes of the mechanical devices that he wanted to copy. He had no written documents for the customs officers to confiscate when he left England. Back in Boston, Lowell formed a corporation with Nathan Appleton and raised $400,000 from other wealthy families to build a state-of-the-art spinning and weaving mill that would manufacture cloth using an entirely mechanized procedure that began with raw cotton. Lowell hired the mechanic Paul Moody to construct their first water-powered mill, which was built in 1814 in Waltham, Massachusetts. Since it soon exceeded its available water power, Lowell raised $8 million from 80 wealthy families through the next 15 years. He then moved his factory about 50 miles or 80 kilometers north of Boston to the site that would become the town of Lowell, Massachusetts. By harnessing the power of the Merrimack River waterfalls, the town grew from a few farmer fields in 1820 to an industrial town of 22 mills by 1830. Its population was 20,000 persons in the year 1840. The Lowell Mills were much larger than any other and needed many employees. Initially in 1820, workers in the Lowell Mills were young women from the farms of New Hampshire and Vermont. The women typically worked for a year or two before marrying, and it was a bit of a radical change for some of us 20-year-old girls to be accumulating money. We earned money to do with as we please, but had to work 11 hours days and lived in crowded boarding houses near the factory. An older and respectable widow would supervise the boarding house and encourage us to follow the 10 o'clock curfew and to attend church on Sunday. We can believe that these are just the sorts of assurances that would be expected by parents sending their daughters to live at a newfangled and distant factory. In 1834, Davy Crockett turned Lowell's Mile of Gals and said that they were well-dressed, lively, and genteel. As one form of entertainment, the girls pitched in together for a subscription to a Paris fashion magazine. The Lowell girls published their own periodical, The Lowell Offering, containing discussions of their experiences and thoughts. The girls also objected strongly to each proposed wage reduction or increase in working hours or machinery speeds. In 
In the 1830s and 40s, the Lowell girls were being replaced by immigrants who would work for lower wages. At this time, many immigrants were arriving from the farms and famines of Ireland with the resulting glut of persons who would work for low wages. One Lowell manufacturer was quoted in 1855 to say, I regard people just as I regard my machinery, and I'll keep them for as long as they'll work for what I'll pay them. Those people are part of my machinery. It had taken just 35 years for this manufacturer's greed to grow to sufficient magnitude that money was more important than humans. By 1855, there were 52 mills in Lowell, employing 8,800 women and 4,400 men, and making two and a quarter million square yards or meters of cloth per week. This huge amount of cloth would be turned into manufactured clothing and meant that we farmers were making less and less of our own clothing. We women stopped having to spin thread at home and so had more time for other things. Since factory-made clothing began to replace homemade flax clothes, little flax was grown after 1835. In the first decades of the 1800s, the emerging industry of the North sent products further and further into rural New England and began to be transported all the way to the south and to the western frontier. New fashions still originated in the capitals of Europe, appeared a few months later in the seaports of America, and took additional time to work their way out into the countryside and to the west. Until a few thousand years ago, our own muscles provided the power needed to make civilization function. We invented pulleys and levers to multiply the power of a single person by a factor of 10. Water and wind powered mills appear around 600 BC and by the year 1800 provided as much power as hundreds of persons. Water is very heavy, weighing 64 pounds per cubic foot or a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The weight and energy of motion of the water within this river is used to power the Lowell Mills. The water turns a large wheel and then long belts are used to deliver power to each floor of the factory. More belts deliver power to each machine. And there are numerous such factories throughout Lowell. Here is a model of the factory. and the belted transmission of power from the river to each floor. And to each machine. While mechanical production techniques led the way in Lowell's cloth factories, other items were partially or fully handmade. <laughs> 
Flick explains that a final product often had a complicated history. For example, a fiber might be combed and carted in a country home on an outward basis, spun by machine in a mill, woven by artisans in an urban shop, and then dyed or printed in a small manufacturing plant. Shoes were mostly made through outwork in the home, in which shoe components were taken to a family who would make the final shoe. By the way, in the year 1976, my sister worked in her home lacing leather purses that were brought and retrieved by a merchant. Sewing machines were not used in the shoemaking process until the 1850s and 60s. Until then, the final shoe design was controlled by shoemaking artisans, not by machinery. Shoes became the major product of the town of Lynn, Massachusetts. Tuna says that Philip Kirkland opened the first Lynn shoe shop in 1636, and that in the early 1700s, one Lynn shop had 40 shoemakers, each working independently to make an entire shoe. Around 1750, Thomas Degas divided a shoe into its components, each of which were assigned to a different worker. These shoe pieces were then taken to a home to be sewn together into the final shoe. In the 1830s, shoe production was moved to large centralized workshops. Soles were then being nailed rather than stitched. By 1835, those of us who are working in these New England workshops were hand making 15 million shoes per year. And not coincidentally, the population of the U.S. was then about 15 million persons. Few shoes are made in the U.S. today. William J. Young's company handcrafted surveying instruments in an unmechanized factory. He was born in 1800 and at the age of 13 became an indentured apprentice and then in the year 1825 inherited his trainer's business. As the nation expanded westward, land speculation created a demand for his instruments. By 1850, his 20 employees were making 150 instruments per year. He paid his employees very well so that they would not open competing shops.